Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe Trena, and welcome to this, our 19th installment of Please Join Me. Uh, I have the great pleasure of having with me a gentleman who has been described as one of the greatest alto players ever. And I've heard him play, and I can attest to the fact that he really is one of the best players that I've ever heard, and certainly one of the best players on the scene today. Uh, Phil Woods, no less, the late great alto sax legend, uh, was quoted as saying that. And another quote that I'd like to share is, Gordon has embraced the history of his instrument, carrying with it the ability to extend music as a universal language. And that was from Wayne Shorter. Uh, John Gordon's a native New Yorker, a saxophonist and composer. He was born into a musical family and began playing at the age of 10. He attended performing arts and he won numerous competitions in his early years. Uh, this led to performances as a soloist with Julius Grossman Orchestra, the Goldman Band, and the Performing Arts Orchestra. In his mid-teens, John's love for jazz was sparked after someone played him a Phil Woods record, and he began sitting in regularly with Phil Woods and studied with Phil Woods. He attended the Manhattan School of Music in the 80s, and he also has worked with a countless number of jazz stars, including Charles McPherson, Doc Cheatham, Jackie Terrace and Red Rodney, Roy Eldridge, you wouldn't think he's old enough to have worked with all of these guys, but I guess as a child, they uh, brought him in and they sat him on a chair where he could be seen by the audience. Uh, he's also worked with Maria Schneider, Clark Terry, the Vanguard Orchestra. He's led his own groups and worked all over the world. And he's appeared at all the major jazz clubs here and also abroad. The Blue Note, Birdland, Iridiums and Smalls, and notably, John won the Thelonious Monk International Jazz Saxophone Competition in November of 96, and the judges for this event were an array of legends, including ja Wayne Shorter, Jackie McLean, Joe Lovano, Jimmy Heath, and Joshua Redman. It's my pleasure to introduce John Gordon, coming to you from Winnipeg, which I believe is, I want to say it's Ontario, am I right? It's, uh, it's in Manitoba, Jeff. Manitoba, Manitoba. Uh, I know I know Canada not very well. Uh, John, what's happening with you? How are you doing right now? Uh, I know you teach up there, yes? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, uh, thankfully. I mean, you know, as we were just talking a moment ago before we started, you know, uh, the, the big issue is how, how are we all doing with, with everything that's going on in the world? And I, I have to say my kids are healthy. Uh, I'm healthy, thankfully, knock on wood. Um, you know, and, and I've been able to, to, you know, to teach and, and um, try to move forward, you know, in, in these challenging times. And, and I've been working on a recording project and uh, I had this book called Jazz Dialogues come out in the fall, uh, a, a collection of interviews and, uh, with, with jazz musicians and some stories from the road. And so that's kind of been my year and I'm just, um, I will be coming back to the States in the next couple of weeks and, and hopefully getting a vaccine, uh, you know, but so it's, it's just been, obviously it's been an unusual and a, and, a, and a challenging time to say the least, but trying to find the blessings along the way. Well, sure, as we all are, I was fortunate enough to get a project completed through last year, which was a minor miracle. So I, I do understand, I'm glad you're continuing to make art and to be able to teach. I'd like to ask you to tell us about this recording project, if you would. Yeah, the new recording, uh, the name of it is Stranger Than Fiction. Uh, it's, uh, it's being released through Artist Share. I've been releasing uh, projects with Artist Share since I guess, I guess it became affiliated with Artist Share at the end of 05, and the first project that came out in 06, and there's been four CDs and two uh, live concert downloads. And this will be my fifth CD with them. And um, so uh, the project is essentially a non-et, but um, the way we did is we started recording in the fall up here with uh, folks that are either current and former faculty or former students. And uh, five of us were actually able to record simultaneously in some separation at a, at a studio up here. And then, um, and that would be Will Bonas on uh, piano, Jocelyn Gould on guitar, Fabio Ragnelli on drums, and Julian Bradford on bass. 
Derek Gardner, who you may know, I also work with up here. He uh, teaches trumpet at our, at our school, University of Manitoba. So uh, he played his parts remotely, as did John Ellis, the great John Ellis, a great saxophonist and bass clarinet player, uh, Alan Ferber, and then some former students uh, also contributed, uh, Reginald Lewis, Kristen Martinson, and uh, Anna Blackmore. And then we also had a couple of guests, uh, current jazz uh, guitar prof Larry Roy played, played on one thing, and Oren Evans, a great pianist out of Philly, uh, member of the Bad Plus, and, and whose group, uh, the Captain Black Big Band, was just uh, up for a Grammy. Uh, he played a couple of tunes remotely in Philly. So we did sort of a combination of something that was simultaneous in the same place, and then we essentially added a couple of the uh, rhythm section things and, and all of the other horns remotely. So I had never done a project like that. We're still kind of in the, in the process of assimilating everything, but it's been, uh, it's been great to do a, a project, a large ensemble project again, uh, which I haven't done in a long time. And I've been writing music for, for this size ensemble for, for quite a while. So I'm looking forward to completing it and it should be out in the fall. Now tell us a little bit about the selections that uh, are on this uh, recording. It's gonna be all original music. Um, you know, when I was uh, younger and I was making some, some records on uh, Chiaroscuro and, and um, uh, Jerry Teakin's label, Criss Cross, and, and uh, a couple of other, Double Time was a label that I did some projects on. It was tended to be a mix, a little bit more of um, standards and, and what I call jazz standards by, by uh, jazz composers. And um, I've gone a little bit more towards original writing as time has gone on, I've still, like a few years ago, in 2016, I released something that was basically a project that was um, based on music by what I call jazz, jazz standards by, by jazz musicians, Chuck Wayne, Miles Davis, um, Wayne, Shorter, things like that. But um, there was a project that I did for a large ensemble in 09 called Evolution. It was essentially a non-ed plus strings, percussion, and Bill Charlap, uh, uh, guested on a couple of things, and uh, we had a vocalist, Kristen Berardi from Australia, that was on that as well. So that was essentially for anywhere from 10 to 14 musicians. And this is going to be basically uh, a similar kind of project um, where we'll have um, our, our guitarist, Jocelyn Gould, sing some vocals on, on a couple of things. So it basically is 9 to 10 musicians happening simultaneously, uh, but again, all original music. So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it because I uh, hadn't done an all original project like this in quite some time. So which leads me to ask you, tell us about the music you write, where you get your inspiration from, if I uh, could ask you that, if you can speak to that. Also, uh, who you might be influenced by, obviously, when you do these kinds of things, very personal, and you have something to say musically. So. Would you, would you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. You know, the, the last CD that came out was a, a quartet CD called Answer. And um, somehow it was the inspiration behind that. I had spent a lot of time with Leonard Bernstein's music in 2017. Uh, I did a, a Bernstein tribute concert up here in Winnipeg, which was uh, basically a jazz quintet plus strings and, and three different vocalists. Uh, two of whom were essentially classical vocals. And I love that kind of mixture, you know, where, where we can inhabit different worlds. And certainly Bernstein's music. Right. Like that, right? You know, he's, his associations with uh, Combin and Green and, and you know, it's essentially, a, a, you know, one of, the, one of the major American classical composers of the 20th century, but also loved jazz and was very influenced by jazz. So, um, but... There was a statement of his, uh, our response to, and I don't remember the, the quote uh, fully at the moment, but it was essentially our response to the hate and the, the um, you know, the, the trials and tribulations of, of the world and the injustices will be to make more mu music more, more passionately, more beautifully than ever before. And, or my, our answer to that. And so to me, that's where the word answer came from. And that was the, the genesis of, of calling that record uh, what I did. And two of the originals on that project were named for my sons. One is called One for Liam, 
and one is called Shane. And so I have two boys. Liam just turned 22 yesterday. Shane is uh, 19. He'll turn uh, turn 20 in May. So, uh, and those are the second times that I had recorded, released recordings of tunes from my boys. Um, there was a piece on there called 2000, which was about that year. Um, and just some of the, you know, sometimes it's like, it, it has a certain meaning to you. You imbue it with that. You, you have a certain kind of intention behind it. And then you call it what you call it. And people hear what they hear from it, right? I think particularly with what we do as jazz musicians. Um, people are going to always, or with any work of art, you might have an intention. Like I was, I had a discussion about, about this, you know, inspiration with Maria Schneider way back, I think it was in 06 or 07, and that was in the book. And we were talking about different things and a couple of Paul Clay paintings, which he was talking about a Paul Clay painting as the inspiration for a piece of hers. I think, I believe it was Paul Clay called Dance You Monster to My Soft Song. And she said the original title for that was Killer Bees. Like if you remember when we were kids, we were talking about bees coming from South America that were, you know, or whatever. And so it, it had this kind of meaning for her that, that evolved into something else and then became something else. Um, but I do think that the inspiration for my own writing, you know, comes from a lot of different places. And I, I think certainly family, kids, my, my kids, people have been, who have been very important to me in my life. Uh, I wrote a piece at one time called Grace. That was the middle name of somebody that's very important to me. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think the inspiration for the pieces comes from a lot of different places. Great jazz musicians that have inspired me. People like Charles McPherson has been a big influence on me. Uh, Phil Woods, Jim McNeely, who I've worked with some and studied with some. Uh, classical music, it's a really, it's, it would be, I could, I could sit and talk with you for 30 or 40 minutes about all the different, you know, Bartok's uh, adagio movement from the first violin chord, uh, concerto or, you know, um, a free piece that I heard somebody play. You know, it's, it's Joe Henderson has, is somebody that's a huge influence on me, but that's, that's a couple dozen of hundreds at least that I could probably cite you. Yeah, I, uh, I do like to inquire because you know, I spoke with Scott Newman, the drummer who works with me and gets a lot of inspiration from nature. And uh, folks do get inspiration from really everywhere in life. You know, you, you can hear traffic and that can go into an original composition. I want to ask you though, uh, since you're talking about what you're doing now, I want to stay with that. Tell us about the book. It's called Jazz Dialogues, yes? Yes. And um... It was interesting, the, the genesis of it was when I started talking to Brian Camillo that runs Artist Show, and I met Brian through Maria, like way back in the early 2000s, or around 2000. And at that time, Maria said to me, Brian's got this idea that's really amazing. I can't tell it to you yet, but it's gonna, it's gonna be amazing. And then a couple of years later, I saw Maria Schneider was the first artist to win a Grammy uh, that was, for a CD or a recording that was not re released in stores. And that was through Artistship. And I thought, okay, this is where things are going and I really want to learn about this. And so I reached out to Brian and we talked about doing some recordings, but he said, but we don't just do recordings. There's a lot of content that we encourage our artists to release along with the recordings, um, you know, lesson packages and things, which I, I have up there. Um, a blog, uh, you know, I, I guess we didn't really call it a podcast, but just basically audio files of discussions, interviews, uh, conversations with, with musicians. And he said, so what amongst that kind of thing would you like to do? And I said, I'd really like to interview my friends and my, my heroes and my mentors and the people that I work with in the coming years. And Brian said, oh, that, that would be great. And he said, you know, you could probably turn that into a book someday. And I really, at the time, didn't think I would ever do that. But as I started to piece these together. So some of the first people that I interviewed were Eddie Locke, who got me my first apartment in Manhattan when I was 19, um, and one of my, my real musical fathers. Uh, Bill Charlap, who you know, and I, has been one of my closest friends since we started going to performing arts high school in September of 1980. Uh, Phil Woods, uh, Jim McNeely. I remember we were doing a doing a, a festival in San Juan. I believe it was in 06 or 07. 
And, uh, and I was uh, basically subbing for Brian Lynch, as I sometimes did at that time with, with Phil's quintet. And we played two alto. And um, so I did an interview with Phil, did an interview with, with Jim McNeely, and I just kept going. And I, I had worked quite a bit with Maria in the 90s into the early 2000s, so I, I interviewed Maria. Um, and, I, and I was working with Mark Turner. We had a two saxophone group at that time. I just kept going and going. And then before I knew it, I had like, I don't know, maybe 14 or 15 of these. And then I thought, okay, maybe I'll turn this into a doctoral dissertation at some point. Because as I was compiling them in the late, whatever it was, 09 or so, uh, and I was realizing, okay, I'm, I'm really assembling something here. And I would post excerpts of them. Scott Robinson, one of my big heroes, I'm sure you know Scott Joe. Um, I, I went back to school, I finished my undergrad degree, did a master's, and I, I approached several schools about doing a doctoral degree. And essentially the feedback was it's a little bit too wide open. You know, sometimes with a doctoral dissertation, they want something very granular. And it's almost more about the process of the research than the, the actual content in, you know, in terms of what I was hearing. And some of the possible doctoral dissertation topics they were throwing out, like why did tenor players prefer Rico threes to three and a halfs in 1967 in the New York Jazz? You know, it's like, you know, or let's talk about jazz journalism in 1972. I had to do something that I was passionate about. And to me, like sitting down with these musicians, I was really passionate about that. So I thought, you know, by I'd say maybe 2011, 12, 13, when it started to become apparent to me that, okay, I'm probably, or maybe a little after that, 2014, 15, I'm probably not going to get this turned into a doctoral dissertation. Maybe I'll, I'll turn it into a book. And so I did some in that period. I think I did one with Ken Poplowski, uh, Chuck Red, Bill Easley, who I'm sure you know. Um, and, uh, and then when the pandemic hit, I thought, you know what, now's the time to try to finish that book. Because I had, like everybody, I, had, I, had a, I was supposed to go to Europe. I was supposed to go to Australia. I had gigs and, and guest appearances around the States. When all of that fell through, I thought, okay, let me turn this, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, really make sure to finish this project and, and just dedicate it to being a book and not trying to uh, go the doctoral route anymore with it. And so I compiled some stories from the road from musicians and um, the book starts with a, with a discussion I had with Jay McShann when I was 20 in Heathrow Airport in 1987. I got bumped off my flight last minute I was sitting around Doc Cheatham and Flip Phillips and Ken Poplowski and all these great people. And then they said, will John Gordon make himself known? I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and the long and short of it, it's like, they took me off the flight. A businessman was willing to pay first class price on, on Pan Am, Pan Am 1987. Right? I'd never flown any place. I'd never played a, you know, a, a major jazz festival before. So I'm kind of wandering around trying to figure out how I'm going to get home. I run into Jay McShane and I sit and talk with him for an hour. And, and the whole kind of genesis of the book or the, 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 the uh, doctoral dissertation of the book, if you will, is what does it mean to be a stylist in jazz? You know, he said, hey, you know, you sound good, but now you have to learn, learn about what it means to be a stylist and find your own thing. You know, you're listening to Charlie Parker and that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's good. Now, how do you find your voice? He said, you know, when I was, when I was your age, you know, you'd hear Basie, Art Tatum, Ben Webster, you knew who it was in two, three notes. He said, and you know, a lot of people play their instruments well, but do they find their own sounds? Do they find their voice? Do they find what they have to contribute? And then the very first interview in the book is with Eddie Locke, and he said the same thing. He said, you know, it's like, what do you have to offer? That's really what, what the music is about. And I, and, and, with musicians as diverse as, you know, Jay and Eddie Locke and Jan Garbarek and Maria and Mark Turner and Ken Poplowski. I think that's the, you know, that was sort of the underlying theme. You know, how do we find who we are and what we have to offer? I wanted to talk please a little bit about your relationship with Phil Woods because he seems to loom large in your early career. Uh, you sat in, you listened, you studied. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences with Phil? I was lucky enough to hear him uh, at the Vanguard uh, a few years before he passed on. And uh, yeah, it was a great experience. I've listened to him since I was a kid, of course. I went to IS-61 on Staten Island. I happened to have an amazing 
music teacher and band director, a guy named Larry Lorenzano. Sure, I was in the community band under his uh, baton. Yes, I played the Wednesday nights at, uh, at the college, right? The college of Staten Island. Yep. yep, that's where I met a bunch of budding jazz musicians. Uh, the two brothers, what were their names? Mickey, the Lamort brothers, David and Mickey. Correct, and they used to play Broadway, and I was like so impressed by that. And you know, I, I did my butchering of those, uh, you know, uh, medleys of Broadway shows and yeah. semi-classical. Anyhow, it was a great experience, and Larry was great. He was a drummer, wasn't he? No, Larry was a trumpet player. Oh, trumpet player. So, so anyway, I played with Borough Wide Band with all, all our friends, people like Willie Hakeem and, and Tyrone Jackson. So, uh, no, this is just interesting for me because I didn't know you had as much of a, of a Staten Island association. So, so Larry took me aside in, in eighth grade. We were all excited to audition for performing arts. And I think the summer of 1980, which was, was the year that, that fame came out, the movie. And like, right. yeah. and so uh, a bunch of us auditioned. Larry helped us. We, we auditioned to the school and, and we got in. And um, I was not a sophisticated, advanced student. I, I started in sixth grade. You know, my audition piece for performing arts was Selections from Rocky. Okay. And then I met Bill Charlotte the first day and Eleanor Beinman and chunk of song and like these amazing players, you know? And all of a sudden I was in this very deep pool and it was incredibly inspiring. And around the time that I got into performing arts, Larry Lorenzano took me aside and said, listen, I'm gonna get you a scholarship at the JCC. Joe, if you remember the Jewish Community Center at the corner of Victory and Forest, right opposite uh, uh, Silver Lake there. I remember it well. Is that, did you study with Caesar there at all? No, I studied with Caesar in his studio with the uh, with the potbelly stove. Yes, yes, I remember. I mostly was only there in the summer because during the year in high school, I studied with Caesar at the JCC. So Larry said to me, he said, are you Jewish? I said, I'm not. I actually thought my father was Jewish when I was a kid. It's a long story. But um, he said, well, I'm not and neither is Caesar. But I got you a scholarship to study with Caesar tomorrow. At, uh, at the Jewish Community Center. They know me there and, and I put in a word for you and they're giving you the scholarship. I didn't have to audition. Larry just got it for me, right? And I come from pretty, I mean, I, I come from real pop, okay? I'll just, yes, I, I know like that. that. And I, I wanted to touch upon that a little later if you want to talk about it. Sure, like I didn't have an, I didn't have an instrument. You know, I couldn't, we didn't have, uh, you know, and it was a couple of friends like that. And here's what Larry did. He gave us junior high school instruments to take to high school and said, use them as long as you can. Now, you could never do this now, right, 40 years later. You'd never have, there'd never be a circle. But like that's, if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been able to practice in the summer. I wouldn't have been able to go to performing arts, any of that. So those kinds of things, right? So I had heard about Susan DeMora, who was a legend, but I hadn't really gotten to hear him play. But then I saw him play a little bit with the Sims band. They used to play those outdoor concerts, I believe it was maybe Monday or Wednesday nights, outdoors in the summer at Silver Lake. And, uh, and they, would, they would do performances there. And so I heard a little bit about, so I got introduced to jazz through Cesar DeMauro. Now, Cesar DeMauro was a brilliant classical and jazz saxophone player, also played great oboe. Right. And he had studied with the great Joe Allard. And he said, eventually I want you to go and study with Joe. I said, okay. So um, I had a lot of bad habits on the saxophone. It, it took years for me to understand a lot of things that I was doing, but the, you know, that I needed correcting on and needed to grow with. And Caesar was the beginning of that process, but he taught me scales. He introduced me to jazz harmony, two, five, one harmony. And then I think it was maybe early, early in junior year in high school, my friend uh, Jay Rodriguez, who you may know, who also went to performing arts with us, a wonderful saxophone player. He played me and Curtis Haywood, another terrific saxophone player we all went to school together. He played us some Paquito de Rivera records, which we loved. And he was studying with uh, Paquito at the time. And then he said, and you got to check out Phil Woods. And he put on these Phil Woods records and it kind of changed my life. Because I was studying the birds, so I was studying the Omni book with Caesar. But when I listened to the records, Joe, when I was 13, 14 years old, I just heard like an old scratchy record. I didn't get it, right? When I read the, the, when I was reading them, so it was almost like, you know, as a teacher, you, you learn this. 
Sometimes you get it from hearing it. Sometimes you get it visually. Sometimes you get it from talking about it. When I heard Phil play, and then I went back to the Omni book, I was like, oh, I get it now. It was just, it was like a light went off and I pieced it together. And then I heard Cannibal, you know what I mean? And it was almost like, um, I was able to hear past like an old recording that somebody recorded informally, uh, you know, in Birdland in 1950 or something, because you're hearing like this, the, the, the lack of sound quality or whatever. And then when I went back and heard Bird, I realized, oh, so this is the guy that actually created the language and actually, you know, to me, it's like, I, I sometimes start, start students with, with Stitt and Phil Woods because it's almost simplified Bird. Because really what Charlie Parker was doing was actually more complex rhythmically and harmonically in many regards. Um, and so, you know, and, and I started to realize, but so when I heard Phil, I had this kind of light going off moment of like, this is why I'm doing this. Simultaneous to that, I met a friend's parent at school that was going to jazz clubs. And she said, would you ever want to come with me? Uh, her name was Margaret. And uh, I said, oh, I'd love to. And so she started taking me to jazz clubs. So uh, we went to the first, first jazz club I ever went to. Actually, I sat in at a place called Dan Lynch in the summer of 1980 when I was 13 because uh, I went to school with uh, a young woman named Denise Dicey. Her dad, Bill Dicey, ran the, the blues jam session there on Sundays. And we went for about a year or so. But actually going and hearing jazz was 7th Avenue South. It was November of 1983, I was 16. And we heard the Art Taylor Quartet with Clark Terry, Branford, and Ron Carter. And there was no uh, chordal player. And Clark sang mumbles at the end of the night. And I just thought, I, I, like, I, just, I was like in a non-ordinary reality kind of experience. You know, like to, the first time you ever hear jazz live and it's Clark Terry and he sings mumbles and you didn't even know you know what I mean? Like, and then the next week or the, the following Monday, we went and heard the Gil Evans Orchestra there. And Dave Sanborn was in the band. And Dave obviously was very, very famous at the time. And we were all fans. And I go up and talk to him. He couldn't have been nicer. And he actually invited me to play with the band. But Gil was like, you know, I, I was 16 and I looked like I was 12. You know, I, it was just kind of gave me a look and it didn't happen, but it was kind of an amazing thing. I, I couldn't play, but it would have been amazing. But right around that same time, in that first few weeks of going and hearing jazz live, I went and heard Phil live for the first time at a place called Lush Life. I don't know if you remember that club. It was just opposite Village Gate on the same side of uh, Bleecker Street, on the south side of Bleecker Street. And I, I went and heard him as much as I could. I introduced myself. I told him I was studying with Caesar, and Phil loved Caesar. He said, oh, Caesar's great, man. You couldn't have a better person, a better player, a better teacher. Um, but I continued to go and, and see Phil and, and talk to him and ask him for lessons. And he finally kind of looked at me and said, well, can you play? You know, if you're ever around Phil, he could be pretty gruff, you know. But, but you know, he had as much love as anybody that you'd ever meet. And I said, well, I, um, he said, well, here's my card. Call my wife. You got to pay me whether you can play good or not. So uh, I called his wife. I scheduled the lesson. I went out there. And the bus got canceled. And I, I, got su I was there super late. And I felt so terrible. But he still saw me when I got there and, and um, you know, and, and spent a whole bunch of extra time with me. And so every lesson with him was like, you know, I'm, I'm hanging with my hero, right? It was, it was just, it was, I mean, it took me like five hours to get out there each way because it was two hours on the bus from Port Authority. And I'm coming from Staten Island, the bus to the boat, the train, the, you know. But... I mean, lessons with Phil were, they were hysterical for one thing, because he was constantly joking and, he's, and I'm recording. He's like recorded on a, you know, little, little uh, cassette player. And oh, it's just, just certain jokes I, I don't think I can tell in this, in this context, but uh, um, you know, just, just he would be, uh, he, was, he was funny. Uh, let's just leave it at that. But, but he would throw stuff at you. He's like, okay, so we're going to, he, he said, here's the Bartok violin duets. We're going to uh, play these together, but you have to, um, you have to transpose it. It's like, what? I don't know how to transpose. One, two, three, one, two, three, boom. We're in, you know, so that was Phil. Or 
I'm going to put on Petrushka. He, th he threw the score at me here. And you better be able to tell me where we're at. And I was, I had taken, was taken conducting at performing arts. So I had some idea how to follow the score, but that was the kind of stuff he would do along with, you know, just whatever else we were doing and things he would sign. Me. The third lesson, Bud Johnson had died the night before. And I didn't know who Bud Johnson was at the time. You know, I was 17. Uh, Kim Parker, who was his stepdaughter and Charlie Parker's stepdaughter, came and picked me up at the bus stop and informed me what had happened. They had actually tried to call me and, and cancel, but this before cell phones, I didn't get the message. And, uh, and Phil was just heartbroken. And he just spent the whole day with me. I was there 24 hours. Kim and I took the bus back into the city the next day. And that was like, yeah, I mean, just to see somebody that you really admired and see how devastated he was by the loss of one of his heroes and one of his mentors. Um, and, you know, one minute he'd say, play me Bird's solo break on a night Tunisia. I said, I don't really know it. Play it anyway. You know, so I try to play it. Um, write me a rondo. Um, do this, you know, and a lot of stuff I couldn't do well, but I, I did my best. But he just threw stuff at me all day. Play me the opening to the Rite of Spring on the piano. Ba -da -ya, ba -da -ya. You know, like it was just that kind of thing. And, and at the end of the day, and I just remember at one point during the day, like when, when he picked me up, he's like, you know, if you're coming to my house, don't come into my house if you're not trying to change the world. I've, I've known too many people that I loved that gave their life for this music. And if that's not what you're about, I'm not interested. Right. And so, and that, you know, and so he was kind of just in that, that mind frame that, that, that day. And, um, and I, I, you know, I really understood, you know, and I, I really, uh, I was just incredibly moved by everything that happened that day. And at the end of the day, he said, okay, I'm taking you in. I'm taking one more of your young cats in. He said, don't get cocky and don't let me down. I said, I won't. And, and he said, and you never pay me a dollar again. And so I would go there. I would offer to do stuff. You know, I would, I would offer, I said, do you need your lawn mowed? What, you know, whatever. And I would do stuff like that, but then he would cook, right? And he was a great cook. So then instead of having an hour lesson, you know, I'd hang for six hours. So uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, I've had a few people that were like fathers in my life. And, and I'm blessed to say that Phil was, was, was one of the small group that was, um, yeah, you know, I got taken in by my hero. What can I tell you? How, how lucky is that? Him and Charles McPherson, those guys were so good to me. I mean, I, I couldn't have had any better mentors than that on the Alto. I mean, forget it. Well, now that you mentioned Charles, of course, we have to talk about Charles. The reason being is that I interviewed him several installments ago, and he and I have become acquainted, hmm. and he's been very generous to me because I've never met him, but the interview is quite, um, I think, uh, one of my best, and it's quite, um, I mean, he's, he's an intellectual, he's very articulate, he thinks about things big and small, the universe, and yes. he said music is, you know, he said the universe is basically frozen music, and, um, you know, he got me thinking, and it's just inspiring to talk to someone like that, and he was nice enough to give me a nice quote for my latest recording, and again, you talk about changing the world, well, you know, in, in my little way, I always thought, well, I'd like to bring some beauty into the world. Of course, I took up the clarinet, so that went out the window. But, uh, you know... Uh, you the Frank West quote about the clarinet now? <laughs> what's that? Shall we mention the Frank West quote about the clarinet? Please do. He was my next door neighbor in Manhattan. He used to play, he used to play the saxophone. And in those days, I, I, you know, played at the alto. And he would play something, I would play back, and you could hear the window shut <laughs> on his side, you know? But tell me, Frank West's quote is? Oh, you haven't heard it. No. Well, I, I cannot tell it in full. I'll just say the, the clarinet was uh, invented by three gentlemen, shall we say, that never met each other. Um, so that, that was his take on the clarinet. You know, not that I knew Frank super well, but I, I knew him some, and he, he was great. He was great to play with and, and meet and hear. Last night I was watching an interview uh, I don't know if you know the guitarist, Mike Moreno. He's doing a lot of great stuff from his home. Uh -huh. He had uh, an old friend of mine, Ben Monder, on. And ben is oh, him I know. Yes. Ben is a brilliant contributor, one of my favorite guitar players. 
and we've known each other since Augie's in like 1985 or something. Uh -huh. And and so Ben said that he went to this one school. I want to say it was in Westchester, specifically to study with Chuck Wayne. And you might not associate, you know, Ben Maunder's body of work between his work with people like now he came up playing with Jack McDuff, but people know of him doing his own things currently on ECM, playing with David Bowie, playing with Maria Schneider. But you know, Chuck Wayne was was you know one of the just an amazing contributor. And like you, Joe, I didn't realize, you know, how important or Don Joseph or I did get to hear Jimmy Nepper. I remember Caesar telling me. Ah, yes, I heard Jimmy Nepper. I have to say this. I heard Jimmy Nepper at maybe it was the choir loft, one of these places. Yeah, yeah. Down, down in Staten Island. And I'll never forget this. I'm sitting with Don. He said, this guy knows his way through the changes. And he played Laura. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a song that's always been confounding to me. You know, it's one of the most beautiful ballads uh, of the 20th century. But yeah, I was glad to have heard him myself. Well, Caesar told me when I was studying with him in high school, he said, listen, there's a great trombone player. He's from out here. Jimmy Nepper. And I don't know where Jimmy was from originally, but apparently he was on Staten Island a long time. I think he owned a building and he was like a superintendent in the building. I got to play with him with the American Jazz Orchestra a few times. Uh, you know, quite the character and an amazing trombonist. Played with, with Mingus, was one of his yes. associations. But I went and heard him play at a church and it was just beautiful, you know, especially hearing, hearing his ideas. I mean, you know, I had 14 year old ears or whatever, but still, to be able to hear that um, was was really interesting. So, but yeah, again, again, uh, for, for your age, uh, the scene you were in and able to inhabit, you know, miraculously in a way, allowed you to work with all these greats from the genesis of Bob. You know, and uh, people who are still legendary. And thank God we have enough, you know, recorded evidence of that. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about your your youth because I know that you had what I consider to be somewhat of a hard scrabble upbringing. Uh, so yeah, I know it's Dickensian. You know, it's like you were you were bit. like you grew up you grew up like Oliver Twist, right? So 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 so, so, so tell so so tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's funny uh, when I was when I went back to school to finish my my undergrad degree. I had, I was only two academics short at, uh, at Manhattan School of Music, but the, the registrar there is, a, well, because it's been 20 years, I want you to do five academics. And I, I was teaching at Purchase at the time, and you could, I was able to take some courses at a discount. And I did a French course, I did a psych course, I did a couple of history courses, and I thought, I'll do a writing course. And there was a, a memoir writing course at work with my teaching schedule. I thought maybe memoir writing or poetry, just to learn about it. And I, I have a little bit of an odd backstory. So my mother's first husband was the great jazz baritone saxophone player, Bob Gordon. Bob Gordon is on the record, uh, Clifford Brown and his West Coast Sidemen. Um, uh, Bob died in a car accident in 1955. I believe it was August of 1955. He was only 27 years old. He won downbeat artists deserving wider recognition. I guess it was that, that next year. I remember when I met Johnny Mandel and worked with him a little bit in, in, in 2009, I asked him, I didn't realize he knew Bob. He said, oh, there was two guys that I lost in my life I never got over. Joe Maney, the alto player that, that Phil and many people raved to me about. He was very close with Dizzy and, and Bird. He was a great West Coast alto player, Joe Maney, M-A-I-N-I, and Bob Gordon. He said, I never got over losing those guys. Uh, and he said, Bob was going to make such, such a contribution. He was... And even now, like there's, I remember there's a, there's a video, who are the important baritone players you should know about or something like that on, on YouTube. And the first one they list is Bob Gordon. And, um, you know, Bob, uh, you know, you always think of Jerry Mulligan, Harry Carney and Pepper, but Bob is in that kind of next, you know, that next thing of where, you know, he is on a bunch of West Coast records. And so through an odd series of circumstances, Joe, I thought that he was my father. And that was why I always wanted to play the saxophone. So, um, yeah, I, I grew up poor. I was a single mom with a lot of uh, problems that she uh, needed help with. And, um, you know, and I was in some rough neighborhoods. And, you know, sometimes when I go back, uh, walk around Staten Island, I got jumped over here. I got my bike stolen here. I got my, you know. So it's like, you know, that, that's my version of the, the Staten Island tour or whatever. But I got adopted by all my friends' families is essentially what happened, Joe. So it was like, 
I was living with my friends' families pretty regularly from the age of three. You know, I was, uh, and oftentimes there was nobody in my home because of what was going on there. Or, you know, my mom was away, shall we say. And so, um, so I just had people that took care of me. And I was never, uh, I, there were many times I could have gone into like a, a foster home or an orphanage or something like that. But to the extent that I could have any say over it, which really began when I was 11, I always opted not to do that. Um, for many reasons to try to help my mother, not first of all, when she was, when she was at home and, um, and just because I, I just, I, I felt I was going to be a little bit more in control of my own destiny that way. And the, the combination of those two things was just like, just overwhelming. There was no way that I was going to sort of leave as, as crazy a situation as I was in to the extent that I had the ability to say, no, I'm going to stay here. You know, even at seven and eight, there were some things where there was a window, let's say. But I mean, the bottom line is I, I got, I, I have so much family, you know, so many people's families that kind of came and, and saw where I was at and what was happening. And, you know, listen, my mother was a great person that was a, a very talented singer that knew, had, knew a lot of great people. Like I remember my older brother who I didn't meet till I was, you know, we had two different fathers. but. Um, um, when they were living in Indianapolis at one point, several years before I was born, he said, I, I, I've been watching TV. I go out in the street. I'm playing with my friends. Julie London pulls up in front of our house, gets out of her limo, and walks to the door. And mom meets her with a big hug. Like, our mother knew what? Like, you know, like she was friendly with all these people. She was friendly, I guess, uh, from the L.A. jazz scene. And she, was, she, she had stories about Jonathan Winters. And so... You know, she was a she was kind of an amazing but profoundly wounded person that went that lost two husbands and a child by the time that that I was born, and I just don't think she ever completely got over those things, and um, just went through incredible tragedy. And um, so I lived in a in a in a unusual circumstance, but got adopted by everybody, including the musicians. You know, later on, people like Larry Lorenzano and and. Uh, and Caesar to an extent, and, and Phil, and Eddie Locke, and Eddie Chambly. And I was going to ask you about Eddie Chambly when you talked about living in the West 50s, because Eddie lived over there. I want to say it was maybe 54th between 9th and 10th, but it was quite close to where you were, 8th and 9th, one of those. But anyway, that's, that's my background, which is kind of nuts. But hey, you know, it's, uh, in, in the end result, I, I got, like I said, I just got adopted by everybody. And I, and I needed all the adopting I could get. Well, listen, uh, it's a tribute to you, even then as a human being, that you recognize the importance of staying with and helping your mother. And others recognize that too. I mean, I, I've been taken in by various folks, musicians too, uh, that were, again, very generous and uh, loving and recognized that maybe some support was needed. But look, I guess you can view it in a way, and maybe you do, as this all goes into your art. And, you know, what Parker said, I think is very true. If you don't live it, it doesn't come out of your horn. Right. So, you know, uh, hey, you know, listen, uh, from where you've come to where you are, uh, it's a remarkable life, and I hope you're enjoying it as much as you can. You know, it, it sounds like you're, you're in a good place. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, I've been talking about this topic that you just inferred there, kind of brought up a little bit to my sons a lot in recent years. Eddie Locke used to always say to me, what I always tell my sons is, whether you're the president or a garbage man, I just want you to be a good person and enjoy your life. Now, those are simple concepts, but they're not easy, right? This is along with like, be yourself as a musician. Who, what, who are you and what do you have to offer? Like in my interview with Eddie, he talked about that and, and how profound that is and how Joe Jones talked about that with him. So you try to do the right thing and you try to be a good person and treat others the way you want to be treated. And I mean, you know, it, in this last year, there's been a lot of challenges, there's no doubt. But I mean, at the end of the day, as I always tell my students, I'm like, wait a minute, we get to like, even in this context, get on a Zoom call and talk about music. I mean, 
Art Blakey told me when I was a teenager, and he came and sat with me at the bar at Sweet Basil's. I had no idea how he knew me. I didn't have a horn to start talking to me. And said, man, just remember how lucky we are. You know, we're really lucky to be musicians, to be jazz musicians. So those people that are going and sitting at a desk every day, nine to five, 40 hours a week, and doing that for 30 to 40 years, that's really paying dues, you know? We get to do what we love. We get to work with and meet great people and travel and see the world. Like, how lucky are we, right? So I really think that that's, and I tell my students that too, you know, like it just, we have to remember, um, you know, I was just talking about my crazy backstory or whatever. I remember seeing a, video, a movie, a documentary, maybe about 25 years ago called Tom's War about a kid as a small child. Uh, his, he was, he was, he was in, basically in the middle of the Vietnam War and what he went through, right? People, people that go through, you know, people that go through that, like that's, those are challenges, you know. Uh, at the end of the day, it's like, if we're, I'm, I'm currently in Canada, I go back and forth to the States. If we're in Canada or, or America and we're playing jazz and teaching jazz, like compared to what's going on in the world, like I think it's important that we be thankful, you know, and really understand, okay, in the scheme of things, I'm blessed. I, I can make a living playing and teaching like, oh my God, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, unloading boxes from a truck, uh, in, in, you know, minus 20 degrees, which it sometimes gets, gets to up here. So I, I think that perspective, first of all, is, is, is valid, is, is the truth. And we just have to remember that in the scheme of things, we're lucky. Hope you folks are listening out there. This is the attitude to aspire to, especially if you're an artist. And uh, again, uh, I always say without hope, there's nothing. So we've got to keep our attitudes positive and we have to recognize that there's always somebody who's a lot worse off and dealing with something that uh, can be a lot darker and even life-threatening. And so, you know, I'm glad to hear that, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we sign off, uh, we're gonna play a selection uh, of John Gordon's choosing, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. This is John Gordon.
John, that was wonderful. And I'm so glad that you were able to pick something that is certainly one of your best and something that's uh, important to you. And um, I just want to uh, sign off by saying it's been great talking to John Gordon. He's an accomplished musician. He's an author. I want him to plug his projects a little bit. He's the author of a book called, tell us, John, called Jazz, Jazz Dialogues. Jazz Dialogues. It came out on Symbol Press in October of last year. And uh, as I told a few friends, I, uh, it's, uh, this, it, this, the publishers are Gary Stager and Sylvia Martinez, and they got back to me a week later. It was the number one jazz release on Amazon for that week. And uh, I, I, I joked, I don't know how many books came out on jazz that week, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, there might have been 20, there might have been two, I don't know, but, uh, but it was nice. Um, and it was, that was really a fun project to be a part of and, and, and get that, uh, put that out there, all that wisdom from all those great jazz musicians. And then uh, we're in the process of finishing a new recording project that will be called Stranger Than Fiction. Uh, I just felt that title, at this time with what we're going through in the world seemed appropriate and it was uh it was though that was a piece i wrote you know some years ago but uh uh yeah that should be out in the fall folks check out john's book jazz dialogues purchase it online please check out john's music there's an extensive discography here for relatively young man we're contemporaries john's a little younger i think and uh you know fork up a couple of bucks please you can buy this music and in these times all artists need as much support as they can you know performing artists especially have been devastated by this pandemic and john i wish you very very well as always and thanks for making the time for us today thank you joe this is joe trainer you've been listening to please join me my guest john gordon uh thanks very much for listening and uh, i hope you will listen in to our next please join me in the future thanks very much everybody be well you've been listening to please join me with joe Trena. be sure to listen anywhere you get your podcasts Keep up with JoeTrainingMusic.com for news and new episodes. You can listen to Joe's latest recording, Tip of the Hat, on all major streaming services and wherever fine music is sold. This episode was produced by Caroline Voigt.